We are going to be in Matthew chapter 7 today. And this is a summer series that we're starting on prayer. And so we'll be talking about prayer for probably three, maybe four Sundays in a row if the Lord uh, leads us to do that. But I have had prayer just whirling in my mind, uh, particularly in putting this teaching together uh, for several days, just over and over again in every way that we can pray. And even in devotional life, we've been talking about prayer. And so I just thought it timely as we are in between books. We finished uh, uh, Acts and before we move on to Romans, uh, I thought it would be a good time. So I'm calling this, this is Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 through 11. I'm calling this teaching prayer, the goal of it. And it's been said of pastors that a good part of our job is to uh, comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comforted. <laughs> To afflict the comfortable and oh. to, no, no, to comfort the afflicted <laughs> and to <laughs> afflict the comfortable. Yep. And in our verses and the, in my time of preparation, there's plenty of both of those uh, in these verses. I found myself uh, afflicted in the sense of I need to be doing something a lot more than I am doing it. And then I found myself comforted in the beautiful realization that God wants to meet with us and what could be better than that. So let's pray and then let's get to our verses. Heavenly Father, it is in Jesus' wonderful name that we come before you now. Just thanking you for being our God. Thank you for coming after us and finding us. And like Paul the Apostle wrote, you have apprehended us. <laughs> You caught up with us, you overtook us, and you apprehended us with your love. And so, Lord, I pray that that would be evident in this teaching. I pray also, Father, that you would use this time to bring us into a place where we're encouraged to be obedient to what you are asking us to do, Lord Jesus. That we would take this seriously as orders from headquarters. I pray this in Jesus' wonderful name, and all my dear brothers and sisters say, Amen. Amen. Let me read our verses. Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 through 11. And here's the way that you can always remember where these verses are. You finish it for me. Oh, thank heaven for 7 11. <laughs> so, Matthew 7 11. Here we go. It reads, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who, who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it will be opened. Or what man is there among you who, if his son asks for bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, Will he give him a serpent? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father, who is in heaven, give good things to those who ask him? Those are words from Jesus, the word of God. I have something that I think should come under the heading of things no one has ever said all right somebody gets to the end of their life do you think they're going to say man i spent too much time praying <laughs> i don't think that that's something that would ever happen we might say something like you know i ate too much <laughs> or there was too much sugar in my diet or i wish i wouldn't have listened to so much news <laughs> but not I wish I would not have spent so much time praying. You see, if we really believed in our hearts and began to live out what's given to us in Matthew 7, 7, 11, 
then we would be praying more. We would be receiving more. We would have more faith. We would be affecting the lives of people around us. If That's if we really believed. Matthew 7, 7 through 11. Let me ask you another question. Do you think it's possible to pray too much? I don't think that it is. But it would be interesting to try that out, wouldn't it? To actually see if you could get to a point where you had prayed too much. Here's what Paul the Apostle writes in 1 Thessalonians 5.16. He says, Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. As I look at our verses and I back up and I want to take a large scope of what the 7-Eleven is telling us, what I see is that we are being extended an invitation by Jesus himself. I think it'd be wise for us to even consider that the Lord Jesus is standing before us saying, I have an invitation for you. You would be like, oh, an invitation for me? And then this invitation, as you step back and look at it, it includes this idea that he's asking you to go after God. Go after him. Go find him. Go get him. Let me read the same verses to you in uh, the New Living Translation. Keep on asking, and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, everyone who seeks finds, and to everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. As we go through the gospel accounts, and indeed as we go through a whole of the scriptures, we find out that God is pursuing us. And we can get that idea in several places. God's after us. Sometimes we think that God is the long arm of the law. <laughs> or God is somebody who you look in your rearview mirror and you see the lights and it looks like a cop car. <laughs> but instead, what you find is God finally catches up with you. It's not to crush you, it's to hug you. And the gospel accounts in particular show us God's after us. Jesus came here because God loves us. He's after us. That the verses that we're looking at, though, do an interesting thing. They kind of spin that around. Where Jesus is there saying, now here's what I want you to do. I want you to go after God. I want you to be asking God. I want you to be seeking God. And I want you to be knocking. And that seems to be in a progression of intensity, don't you think? So the first one, ask God. You go, God? And the second one would be to be seeking. That's a little more where you go, God, God, where? And then the last one is knocking where you go, God. <laughs> so we're moving up in intensity in each one of these things. That switch around I find interesting. That God comes after us and then he asks us to come after him. Now I'm thinking that most of the time, when we pray, we're praying because we want something, right? Isn't that usual? <laughs> let's pray because I want something. Let's, let's, let's go to God. I want something. That's kind of our motivation. That's what we want through prayer most of the time, by and large. But how about this? I wonder what it is that God is after in the area of prayer. I know what I want, <laughs> but what does God want? How does he intend to use prayer? Well, let me tell you, what God wants is you. What God wants is me. Oftentimes, I think the goal of prayer is to get something, <laughs> get what I want. But God's goal in prayer is far more relational. He wants me. 
And sometimes I think, well, I'm just going to spill out my laundry list, you know. But God, I think, is looking and he's waiting and he's hoping that through all of our laundry lists of what we need, we'll eventually turn and say, oh, you're glorious. You're awesome. You know, I, I love you. I'm rejoicing in who you are. I, I think that the Lord waits for that. I think that he looks for that. He wants us to have relationship with him. He wants that relationship to be dependence upon him. And he wants us to know him as our good father. He loves us. He thinks about us. He wants to spend time with us. You know, I think about when I was pursuing my wife <laughs> before we were married. I just wanted to spend time with her. I wanted to see her. I wanted to talk to her. I wanted to find out what she likes and doesn't like and what she's about. That's how I pursued her. And you know what? I'm here to tell you, she pursued me as well. There was one day I came outside my house and I went to get in my car to go to work. And there was a card on my car. And it was from Jeannie. <laughs> Telling me she loved me and she hoped I had a wonderful day. <laughs> she pursued me as well. Nice. That was relationship. The thing that I wanted from her was this deep friendship, this experience I'd not had before and I wanted that with her that's what God wants from us so often we look at prayer to get things and to have a more comfortable life and a lot of our prayers come under that category I'm not saying that's all wrong but I'm saying I wonder what would happen if we began to focus more on what God wants out of prayer and here's an interesting thing for you in regards to prayer. And we could actually spend a lot of time in this one little subject. And it goes like this. Why pray? Why pray? Why do we pray at all? I mean, isn't God all-knowing? Isn't God all-powerful? Isn't God all-present? And in the end of everything, isn't God absolutely going to have his will and his way on earth just like it is in heaven? So why pray? Isn't it already a foregone conclusion with God? I mean, couldn't we spend a whole lot of time in that realm of why pray at all? An all-knowing God, what could I possibly pray about that he would end up saying to me, wow, Paul, I never knew that. So glad you just shared that with me. That's interesting information. If I only would have known that sooner. So we come to that point sometimes where we think, well, why pray? You know, in the previous chapter, that would be Matthew chapter 6, Jesus told his disciples, listen to this, your heavenly father knows what you have need of even before you ask. But he still asks us to ask and to seek and to knock. That's, that's, that's your instruction. That's your instruction today from the word of God. I want you to think for a moment and remember Moses, because I want to talk for a moment about people that pray. You all know somebody who prays a lot? I've had some people in my life that pray a lot. I really enjoy those people. Because if you know somebody that prays a lot, generally speaking, more often than not, they're real peaceful people, aren't they? You say to them, how's it going? They go, good. Well, well how's your life? Blessed. <laughs> it's kind of like Moses when he went up on the mountain and spent day after day, week after week in the presence of God. And when he came down, his face was what? His face was glowing just at the presence of God. Because he had spent so much intimate time with God, there was a change that was not only internal, but external. And everyone could see it. You couldn't hide it. You've been with God. That is God's goal, primary goal in prayer. He wants us He's got all the answers. He's got everything. But does he have your heart? 
And does he have your heart when you go to him in prayer? You know, every, uh, <coughs> I've shared this before, every morning, my goal <laughs> is to wake up and have my very first thought be, good morning, Heavenly Father. Before anything else, before I get out of bed, before I fluff my pillow, before I roll over, my first thought is always, sometimes I hit it, and sometimes I don't. Sometimes I'll be moving through my day and then I'll go, oh, wait a minute. Good morning, Heavenly Father. Is it still morning? Yeah. Good morning, Heavenly Father. <laughs> I hope that you have a good day. I hope that you're pleased. I hope that you're blessed by what you see in your son. And I take that time to connect with God. It's your day, Lord God, not mine. I'm your servant. What do you want to do with me in this day? That's why we work so hard on devotional life, my wife and I. My goal in prayer is to often see something happen. All right, I prayed. What happened? I'm praying and I want something to happen. And I put the emphasis on the word thing. I want something to happen when I pray. But what about God? God is far more interested in my relationship with him. And you know what? I believe that it takes time. I believe that prayer and in connection with your Heavenly Father is something you need to work on. But how wonderful if you actually had that connection on an everyday regular basis, right? <laughs> that you could go to him and you could click in and you could find out the wisdom for today and your work for today and what his plans are for you today. Are your prayers, are my prayers more thing-focused rather than relationship-focused? If, if I switch to this relationship-focused, where I want this intimacy with God, then I find that I can walk away knowing he already knows what I need. And he's my provider. So I've connected with him in a loving way. I've confessed my sins. I've told him that I want him in everything. Now I can move away from that without all the why, oh God, why, and how come, and when is this going to happen? And I, I, I can move from that with this confidence through my connection in my relationship with him that I know that he knows what I need and I know that he'll provide it. I don't have to be anxious. I don't have to, you know, <laughs> I don't have to hit the panic button. I can go directly to trust and know that God hears me and he hears me and he knows and that he's a good God. Uh, go to Jeremiah chapter 29. Let me read one of your favorite verses from the Bible. <laughs> Jeremiah 29 11. Some of you have it memorized. Let's just look at it again, shall we? Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil. To give you a future and a hope. Okay, let's wait. Let's stop right there. I, we look at that. I look at that. I think I even saw somebody with a tattoo of Jeremiah 29, 11. <laughs> and we want to stop right there. We go, yeah, exactly. That's my goal right there. I want to have peace. I want there to be no evil. I want this future and this time of hope. And that's what I want, Lord God. Yeah, good. Jeremiah 29, I love it. But look at verse 12, which begins with the word then. That's a very important word, then. It's like I get this realization, I get this blessing from verse 12 and from verse 11, and then verses 12 and 13, I find out what the goal of that understanding is. So once I know that I've got a good Heavenly Father, that He wants to give me peace, that he doesn't want evil in my life, that he has a future and a hope. I go right on. Now then, verse 12, 
Watch this. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me and I will listen to you and you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. See that? The blessing gift that I have is verse 11. But then that gives me the goal. And the goal is all God-oriented. Go to God. You're going to find me. You're going to search for me. You're going to ask for me. And then look at the start of verse 14. And I will be found by you, says the Lord. Not I'm going to give you stuff. You're going to find me. That's what you're going to find. No wonder David in the Psalms write, Lord, you are my treasure. David writes, you are my portion. But what do we often seek as our portion? Now look, I, God's a good God. He knows exactly what you need. You know, I have a truck and I think, boy, I just saw a truck that looked kind of like mine, only it was bigger. And I say, oh, Lord, I really like to have that bigger truck, you know. I don't know why. With gas prices the way they are. <laughs> but, but you know what I mean? Like, you delight yourself in God. You, you, you have this connection with him. And then on account of this connection with him and your trust that he gives you good things, he might just give you some good thing. And then you just go, oh, Lord. You mean I didn't have to throw a tantrum to get it? right? I didn't have to beg. I just absolutely found God to be my treasure. God to be my portion. In fact, Psalm 37 verse 4 says, delight yourself also in the Lord and he shall give you the desires of your heart. And I remember years back when I was younger in the Lord, I read that and I thought to myself, "Woo wee, I like this verse. Because <laughs> I got a lot of desires in my heart and God's just going to give them to me. But that's backwards, right? Didn't we find that out as time goes by? Because what it really is saying is, part A is delight yourself in the Lord. So I'll ask, is God your delight? Or what is your delight? What is it that you absolutely delighted? You might get a kick out of this. Jeannie and I, when we got married at uh, one point or another, I, we always wanted to have God first and foremost in our lives, above all else. I think I've shared with you, we said to each other at one point, you could be number two in my life. <laughs> God's always number one. Um, but I one time looked at her and I said, I said, you know what? In my life, God's the cake, but you're the frosting. <laughs> Remember that, honey? <laughs> God's the cake, but you're the frosting. So when I'm asked to first of all hear delight, delight means to enjoy. It means to let God be your passion. Your life is going to change dramatically, drastically, when you just let God be your delight. Lord, I'm going to be so connected with you. I'm going to ask, seek, and knock after you in a way that I'll come into this relationship with you, that I can just delight in you, and you're going to take care of everything else. This is good. I'm liking this. That's the kind of life that we're to lead. And I have found that as I do that, that the desires of my heart then begin to change. And what do they change to? The desires of my heart as I've been delighting in God actually begin to change into God's desires. So now I have God's desires implanted in me and that changes everything. The way I look at things, the way I look at people, the way I act towards people, the way I love people, the way I forgive people, the way I enjoy people is the same way God does because he wants to implant new desires in you. But you can't get to that point unless you first find your delight in him. God, you're my delight. Or how about this in an honest prayer? 
Lord, I want you to be my delight. I want to get to that place, God, where I absolutely delight in meeting with you. You know? <laughs> so our desires then change from stuff-oriented to relationship-oriented. Uh, in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, now to him, <laughs> that's our Heavenly Father, the one that we delight in. Now to him, I'm adding this, whom we delight in, Ephesians 3.20, who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us. To him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations. And so hopefully, we are finding to this point that the asking and the seeking and the knocking are far more involved with God getting us than in us getting things. I'm hoping that that, that will begin to change our thoughts and our emphasis towards prayer rather than the laundry list. It's like, Lord, here I am. And I know that you want to be with me. I don't fully understand that, but I want all that that entails in my life. Because when I receive that, and you're my delight, everything else changes. Now, there's more to prayer that we need to pay attention to. And maybe even take note of. And that's that I do want us all to understand there, there are some things that God will not do unless we ask. I know that kind of plays with your mind, doesn't it? God is in eternity. He knows all. He sees the beginning from the end. Yeah, your life in some regards to him are like a rerun. <laughs> He's already seen the whole thing. Uh, but there are some things that God will not do unless we ask. Let me give you a couple right off that you'll be very familiar with. Number one, unless we seek God with repentance in mind, right? Unless we go to God for forgiveness of sin, what? We're not forgiven. He doesn't forgive us. I got to go and ask for forgiveness, don't I? So there are those things that God asks us to do that he will not answer if we do not pray for them. Let me give you another example. Uh, verse you're familiar with, 2 Chronicles 7.14, begins with the word, if, if my people, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face. Can you see it now? That God wants us to seek him? humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then, if then, I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. I'm telling you, if there's ever a time we need to be praying that in this nation, in this world, this is it. This is it right now. And it is in seeking and delighting in God in your relationship with him that he begins to move on our behalf. There are many times in the scriptures, my goodness, there's just a lot of them. God said that he sought for somebody to intercede and to stand in the gap. I don't know if anybody remembers this. And then he says, but no one was found. There are times in the Old Testament where judgment of God was coming and rightfully so judgment. But nobody prayed that he would stop it, and the judgment came. Or somebody prayed, and God stopped the judgment. There are things that God will not do unless we ask, unless we seek, and unless we knock. Let me add this in here. If God puts somebody on your heart, then you're to pray for them. That's why they're on your heart. You see, you really cannot come to the scriptures without realizing that prayer changes things. 
it, it's kind of a fascinating mystery prayer is. But I can tell you this. God tells us to pray and God moves through prayer. There's some kind of a cooperation. There's some kind of a thing that happens in the spiritual realm that prayer opens the door to. Let me give you a couple of examples here. James chapter 5 verse 7, 16. And the earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power to produce wonderful results. Don't you wish we prayed more? <laughs> and we're earnest about it. And verse 17 goes on like this. Elijah was a human as we are. And yet, when he prayed earnestly that no rain would fall, none fell for three and a half years. Then, when he prayed again, the sky sent down rain and the earth began to yield its crops. That's another prayer we need for today, isn't that? Our reservoirs are drying up. Um, Texas is experiencing a tremendous drought right now, and they're wondering how many crops they're going to have. Lord, be merciful to us, Father, and send rain. Send relief, Father, for your people. We need to know that some things will God will not do without our prayers. Prayers actually change things. Now let me touch on another subject. See, all these things about prayer have just been running through my mind. And uh, I've just been going to the Lord in prayer about prayer. And anybody here ever struggled in the area of unanswered prayer? Things that you really, really wanted and things that you really, really sought the Lord for and, the, and just didn't seem to come out the way that you wanted and that you thought would be good. Let me read to you something that expresses uh, what I believe unanswered prayer and how it can hit us really powerfully. It's from Psalm 102. Hear my prayer, O Lord, and let my cry come to you. Do not hide your face from me in the day of my trouble. Incline your ear to me in the day that I call. Answer me speedily, for my days are consumed like smoke, and my bones are burned like a hearth. My heart is stricken and withered like grass so that I forget to eat my bread because of the sound of my groaning. My bones cling to my skin. I am like a pelican in the wilderness. I am like an owl in the desert. I lie awake and am like the sparrow alone on the housetop. Ever been there? I've been there. I know what it's like when you're calling out to God and you hear nothing back and it's quiet. Some people will say, well, you need more faith. Yeah, thanks a lot, brother. <laughs> or maybe there's some sin in your life. Or maybe somebody might even say something like, well, you need to pray more. <laughs> Tossed and turned and cried all night in prayer. I need to pray more. Now, I'm not saying that there might be some truth, some part, you know, in those things. You know, there might be some of that that would ring a bell. But I hoped and I prayed and I cried earnestly over the life of my son and of my dear friend and of others. They're with the Lord now, yes. 
and there's no way that I would want them back and they wouldn't want to come back here. I'll see them soon enough. So what is it that I know in those times? Here's what I know. I know that God is good. I know that he's a good father and that he wants to give me good things. Jesus taught me that. I know that now we see through a glass darkly. There is some mystery to a lot of things. But the puzzle piece that comes together for me is that in prayer, God wants me. And that he's good. It's a, that's a hard answer. Especially when we're in those times of great grief. But I don't know that there is another answer other than God is good. And we've been called to trust him. And we've been called to obey the commands of Jesus in this area of prayer, which is asking, seeking, and knocking. I want you to think about a particular incident, and that is Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. He prayed for something three times. It wasn't a show prayer. I don't think he was like in any way saying, oh, let me act this out as a, as a lesson uh, to the disciples. I think it was a real prayer. He cried out before God three times, Father, if there is any way that this cup can pass from me, let it be so. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. He prayed that third three times, and the third time that he prayed it, sweat and blood dripped from him. That's how intense it was of a prayer. And heaven was silent. It's a hard answer to know that God is good. It's a hard answer to know that Sometimes your prayers don't seem to be heard. The hardest time for me is always when heaven is silent. You had that experience where it just seems like somebody closed a door there and it seems too quiet for me. And I, that's the hardest time I, times I've had in my life. It was George Muller who wrote, Trials obstacles, difficulties, and sometimes defeats are the very food of faith. Have you noticed how some people can go through a hard time and they're crushed and they run away from God? And other people can go through a hard time, maybe even harder than the other person you saw run away, go through that hard time and they end up growing in faith. Through it all, I trusted God. Through it all, he never left me. He walked with me through the fire. He was faithful to me. That's the food of faith. And so keep on asking. Keep on seeking. Keep on knocking. Let me give you another example. Out of Psalm 55, David writes, Give ear to my prayer, O God. And do not hide yourself from my supplications. Attend to me and hear me. I am restless in my complaint and moan noisily. Because of the voice of the enemy, because of the oppression of the wicked, for they bring down trouble upon me and my wrath they hate me. My heart is severely pained within me. And the terror of death have fallen upon me. Fearful and trembling have come upon me. And horror was overwhelm has overwhelmed me. And so I said, Oh, that I might, oh, that I had wings like a dove. Anybody ever thought that? Boy, I tell you, if I had wings like I would just jet out of here. I would just run away from all my troubles. I would, I would hide in some tree far, far away where nobody could find me. 
That's what David is saying. David is praying this. Oh, that I had wings like a dove. I would fly away and be at rest. Indeed, I would wander far off and remain in the wilderness, Selah. I would hasten my escape from the windy storm and tempest. That's a real prayer. That's a real heart of somebody who has really wanted something, prayed earnestly, and, wa- and is not finding it. But look, he j- d- jumping down to verse 16 in Psalm 55, he says, But as for me, I will call upon the Lord. <laughs> you know, ca- careful, careful who you take counsel from. Can I say that? Make sure that your counselor has that delight in the Lord and that connection with the Lord. Otherwise, they'll tell you, beat feet out of there. Run. Now, if God tells you to run, guess what you should do? Run. But maybe the Lord is telling you, I'm going to walk through this with you. And you're going to learn something about me as we walk through this fire. David writes, as for me, I will call upon God and the Lord shall save me. Evening and morning and at noon, I will pray and cry aloud. And he shall hear my voice. You know, I've had times in my life where I walk through my house, walking through my house, you know, and I go, I trust you, Lord. Just out loud. Echo through my house. I trust you, Lord. Over that pain, that hurt, whatever anxious thought, the person I'm worried about, the thing that I'm praying for, that I believe is desperate. Lord, you're going to hear me. You're going to hear my voice cry out to you. He says, God has redeemed my soul in peace from the battle that was against me. For there were many against me. Down to verse 22 he says, Cast your burden on the Lord, and he shall sustain you. What a blessed promise. He shall never permit the righteous to be moved. (coughs) Not going to be moved away from my faith. Not going to be moved away from my trust in God. I refuse to be moved away from prayer. I refuse to be removed away from humility. I refuse to be moved away from from humility and prayer together. I, I will not be moved from these things for my burdens and my difficulties and the things I couldn't handle. I've thrown them onto the Lord. And because I've done that, He will sustain me. But if I think that I can carry these things, I think sometimes the Lord just like, I, I've, I think I've seen the Lord sometimes cross his arms. Oh, you, you, you want to handle it? Let me know when you're tired. Let me know when you're done. And cast that on me. And I'll sustain you with my peace and with my love. And the very last words of David's prayer is this. But I will trust in you. See, our trust is in the words of Jesus, that we have a good Father in heaven and that he desires to give us good things. Let's go back to Matthew chapter 7, verse 11. (laughs) 7, 11 again. Jesus says to you and to me, if you then, being evil... You go, wait, Jesus is calling me evil. In comparison to the goodness of God, you are evil. (laughs) That's what this is. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father, who is in heaven, give good things to those who ask him? So I look at our verses and I kind of replayed them in my mind and I thought to myself, 
all right, what am I learning out of this? You know, what can I carry out of this? Because I do want to have a brand new attitude towards prayer. Do you want to have a new attitude towards prayer? All right, as I look back on this, I'm thinking to myself that above all, in my prayers, God is seeking me. He wants me. <laughs> He's got everything, but sometimes my own heart. And it is in prayer that he wants to capture my heart. In fact, in fact, uh, Revelation 3.20, Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. At the door of your heart. And if you'll open the door, he says, I'll come in and we'll have a good dinner together. <laughs> we'll sit down and have a meal. That's relationship. That's what you're after, Lord? But I want the new car, and I want the house, and I want this and that and the other, and you know. I want more Amazon gift cards. All the things that we want, you know. Here's another thing that I learned. Here's what I believe then. From the words of Jesus. None of our humble prayers are in vain. None of our prayers are in vain. He says, if you ask, you'll get an answer. If you seek, you'll find. If you knock, the door will be open to you. So what prayer is in vain? The only thing that's in vain is if I turn away from my relationship with God, which is what he's after in the first place. Here's what else I learned. That this is a huge encouragement for me to keep on asking keep on seeking and keep on knocking i do that with a humble heart in simple obedience and i commit to prayer we are to commit to asking seeking and knocking let's pray heavenly father i i come before you now we come before you now humbly in prayer and i know that you have been seeking us and in particular, you want our hearts. And we now, Lord God, turn around and let you know, Lord, we are seeking you. And we want you to be our delight. We want you to be the passion of our lives. Because you already know everything that we need. And you are a good God that provides what we need. So, Lord, we want you. We want you to be our portion in this world. We want you to be our treasure. Come now, Father, and find us, for we desire to find you. We pray these things in Jesus' wonderful name, and everyone says, Amen. Let's all stand.